The djembe and dunun drums of Mali herald the arrival on our historical stage of the kings and warriors who were to dominate West Africa from the 13th century for more than 300 years. A roll call of men, some military geniuses, some great innovators or patrons of scholarship in the famed city of Timbuktu. Enter the Mande kings Sundiata, Sunni Ali Bear, Mansa Musa, Abu Bakari II, and Askia Mohammed, kings of the empires of Mali and Songhai. We had great uh, kings uh, who traveled a lot. We had a great civilization. We have one of the biggest universities in the world in Timbuktu at the time, and uh, for Mali is a very important period. These kings were to become the stuff of legend and their empires admired across the world for their culture and riches. The Story of Africa. History from an African Perspective. Part 9. The Empires of Mali and Songhai. Presented by Hugh Quash. The great empires of Mali and Songhai rose phoenix-like from the ashes of the ruins of the old Ghana Empire, which had dominated the Manda area between the 4th and the 11th centuries. The Ghana Empire emerged from the Mande-speaking areas which today span Mali, Mauritania, Senegal, Guinea, Gambia, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Its wealth was based mainly on gold, kola nuts, millet, sorghum, and slaves. They traded with the nomadic Tuaregs of the Sahara Desert, who crossed the Sahel on camels laden with salt, textiles, and exotic goods. But by the middle of the 11th century, this empire had begun to crumble. Out of the ruins came new empires, which were even bigger, and the demise of one and the rise of others has inspired many a griot to put history to verse and recount the turbulent history of this region. Formerly, the kings of Ghana extended their kingdom all over the land inhabited by the black man, but the circle has closed and the Sisi of Wagadu are nothing more than petty princes in a desolate land. Today, another kingdom looms up powerful. Janjo in Mandingo is a song dedicated to the bravery of warriors and has been sung to all those devoted to protecting the land and its people since the era of the Empire of Mali. According to tradition, the Mali Empire began after a battle between two great warriors. Sumauro, the king of Soso, was, according to legend, an evil sorcerer as well as a strong soldier. He had conquered Ghana and many surrounding kingdoms around 1220 and extended his hold over many peoples. But within a few years, he too was forced to yield to the greater military power of a rising kingdom, Mali. At the head of this emerging empire was a young warrior called Sundiata Keta. Sundiata Keta, the son of a hunchback woman, had been prevented from taking his rightful place on the throne of his father's land of Niani in present-day Guinea. At the age of 18, he fled into exile with his mother and siblings. Professor Togola is the director of the National Ministry of Arts and Culture in Bamako, Mali. I think Sunjata played a very important role in the building of the Empire of Mali. That is the information you know, we all from the Grio. After a series of battles and strategic maneuvers, he managed to recover Mandi territory from the old Ghana Empire and extend the boundaries of his empire even further. By 1240, he had not only returned to Niani to reclaim his heritage, he had also formed alliances to defeat the king of the Soso. 
before Sunyata, they were just little kingdom in the Mali. From Mali to Guinea to Gambia to Senegal, the name you hear the most, I mean, is Sunyata, because he was the builder of the empire of Mali. By the time he was 30, many kings depended on Sundiata for their security and indeed their sovereignty. They paid him tribute, and in a great ceremony in Kangaba, a historic state for the Mandi, near the Futa Jalan Mountains in Guinea's highlands, twelve kings of the savanna proclaimed their allegiance to Sundiata, and he was hailed Mansa, or Emperor. Under him, the capital, Niani, and other cities such as Jene Jeno, entered a new, glorious era of peace and prosperity. Dr. Samuel Sidibe is the director of the National Museum in Bamako. The important economic aspect of this sphere was, was given by the trans-Saharian commerce. Uh, people come from North Africa, uh, through the Sahara, and buy gold, uh, buy slaves, and go to North Africa with this gold and this slave. Trade increased through the work of the Dulas, the merchants who controlled the caravan trade across the Sahara. And under Sundiata, the foundation was laid for other even greater developments and new changes. By the 8th century, Islam was growing in importance in the region. People still practiced traditional religion, and many rituals were still being performed to appease the gods. And Sundiata did not encourage his people to behave otherwise. The National Museum in Bamako holds a number of terracotta statues which reflected this pre-Islamic culture. We have these nice statues coming from Jene Jeno, dating from the 13th century. It's a statue linked to animist tradition. And we know that at this period, Islam were becoming very important to Jene Jeno. This statue has been discovered. We've seen the original head disappear. Maybe just to say, we are not now animist, but we broke the head to just say, okay, the statue is no more useful for us. By the time of Sundiata's death, Islam had spread throughout the empire of Mali, sweeping away many ancient customs. Such historical events are the raw material for the orations of the griot, such as Sadio Diabate from Mali. Here she sings in praise of Sundiata's descendant and the next great Malian emperor, Abu Bakari II. Abu Bakari II, often known as Mande Bure, was perhaps one of the shortest serving of the Malian rulers, who gave up his throne in pursuit of exploration and adventure by setting off across the Atlantic. Once Abu Bakr II is the only African who has tried to go to America before Christoph Colomb. Professor Ali Ul Sidi is the chief historian responsible for establishing the city of Timbuktu as a World Heritage Site. So Grayas in the Monday sing songs about the history of Abu Bakr II and the expedition he has organized because he sent his boats from Gambia. Timoko Konati is the project coordinator for an organization called the Quest for Abu Bakari II, set up to delve into this fascinating but controversial chapter in Malian history. We actually don't want to bring forward the fact that Abu Bakr II was the first to ever cross the Atlantic Ocean. We know through evidence that the Vikings from Norway have been there long before, and also the Chinese, they have been there around year 1000. But Abu Bakr's crossing was around the 14th century, 13 and 12. This was some 150 years before Columbus. Arab historians were certainly keen to relate the story of this fantastic voyage. Alumari wrote about this expedition, as told to him by Abu Bakari's successor, Mansa Musa, in 1325. I asked Sultan Musa how the kingdom fell to him, and he said, We belong to a house which hands on the kingship by inheritance. The king, who was my predecessor, did not believe it was impossible 
to discover the furthest limit of the Atlantic Ocean and wished vehemently to do so. So he equipped 200 ships filled with men and the same number equipped with gold, water and provisions enough to last them for years and said to the man deputed to lead them, Do not return until you reach the end of it. Alas, one ship did return. The captain on board reported that he turned back when he'd seen a mighty current in the open sea swallowing the other ships in a mighty wave. But the sultan disbelieved him. Then the sultan got ready 2,000 ships, 1,000 for himself and the men whom he took with him and 1,000 for water and provisions. He left me to deputize for him and embarked on the Atlantic Ocean with his men. That was the last we saw of him and all those who were with him. And so I became king in my own right. It has been said in some books that when Christopher Columbus went back to Spain, he went along with some spares, lances, uh, on tip of whom there was some gold. They made a lab analysis of those gold and it revealed that this gold have the same consistency as gold found in Monday area. And also Columbus confessed that he met there some black traders who were doing some commercial negotiations with Indians. These statements bring me to say that either black people have reached the American continent or somehow the Indians came to Africa. If Abu Bakr II did succeed in reaching America, it raises the tantalizing prospect that Africans and Indians had developed trading links 600 years ago, more than a century before European explorers claimed to have discovered the Americas. Yet as exciting as this story is, the custodians of oral history in Mali have been silent about an African landing in America before Columbus. The Griots didn't see what Abu Bakr II did as a deserving act. For most of them, they just feel as if Abu Bakr II was just a traitor because he left his kingdom and he trusted someone with uh, the ruling and went across the sea. What for? They said it's uh, an, an act of betrayal. Yet if not for the abdication of Abu Bakr II, the Mande would not have reaped the benefits of his successor. Mansa Musa, or Kanka Musa as he is known by some, has been described as one of the most colorful personalities in West African history. He embraced Islam wholeheartedly, and Islam came to dominate many facets of society during his reign. This is how Al-Umari recalled Mansa Musa's pilgrimage to Mecca in 1325. He left his country with hundred loads of gold which he spent during his pilgrimage. He forwarded to the royal treasury in Egypt many loads of unworked native gold and other valuables. This man flooded Cairo with his benefactions. Merchants of Mizer and Cairo have told me of the profits they made from the Africans. Gold was at a high price in Egypt until they came. But from that time its value fell and it cheapened in price and has remained cheap by reason of the large amount of gold which they brought into Egypt and spent there. However, Mansa Musa earned a reputation both home and abroad for more than lavish spending and the ability to cause rampant inflation. In the remote city of Timbuktu in northern Mali, nestling amidst the Saharan desert sands, monuments to the architectural legacy that Mansa Musa introduced still stand today. Proud and tall among the sand dunes, are many mosques and other buildings in the so-called Sudanese style that the king promoted. We had a big mosque called Jingare Bear that was built and it was financed by the king Kanku Musa, Ulansa Musa, when he went to the pilgrimage to Mecca in 1325. When coming back from that pilgrimage, he stopped by Cairo where he met an architect from Andalusia, Abu Ishaq Esahili. He gave him 40,000 mythical of gold to build this mosque. 
So he brought a new style from Saudi Arabia and from Egypt. Building in the Mali Empire was never the same again. Now, structures in Niani, Timbuktu and Gao were to be raised, built out of mud and a stone called Jeniferi. Such architecture drew the praises of many travelers from near and far. But this was not the only legacy he left behind. Because of Mansa Musa, the Empire of Mali was known overseas. And the Empire of Mali had a diplomatic relation with some European countries, you know, like Spain and, you know, even probably France. So this is another big legacy that people don't see. In 1375, Charles V, on one of his maps, Timbuktu was located. And there was, on the same map, a picture of Kanku Musa holding a piece of gold on that map. This ancient map commissioned by the King of Spain, can still be seen today in the National Library in Paris, where it is housed. And certainly, though he reigned for just over 25 years, within this time, Mansa Musa managed to transform Mali from a prosperous kingdom reliant on strong trading links with the Berbers and other merchants to a spectacular empire, which was the rival of others in the world in the 14th century. Under Mansa Musa, it could be said that the Malian Empire consolidated its glory and power and reached its zenith. It was through him that faith in one God took precedence and Islam became the religion of state across the whole land, even though it was largely confined to the elite and not practiced by the masses. The Islamic character and structure of the empire nevertheless took shape, laying the foundation for the others who were to follow. Under Mansa Musa, Timbuktu became one of the major centers of Islamic scholarship under a group of people who for centuries had been persecuted for their pursuit of knowledge. By the end of the 11th century, according to some historians, the former city of Walata, which does exist nowadays, in Mauritania was called Biru. By the end of the 11th century, the scholars of Biru were fighted by the Almoravids, by the Berber people, and they came here, Timbuktu, to get refuge. So they found their own sector called Birunche Kunda, and that sector was a part of Sankore, which was also the quarter and the mosque. By 1332, Mansa Musa was dead. His death was the beginning of the end of the Malian Empire. A series of dynastic struggles for the throne occurred against a background of economic decline. As Mali weakened, Tuaregs and Saharan merchants were beginning to rebel against paying tribute to the inefficient and weak Malian kings. <laughs> This is Juju singing praises to the king and brave fighters of Songhai, the empire which by the middle of the 15th century eclipsed Mali. The Songhai empire was even much bigger than the empire of Mali. So it was really a huge you know, territory going probably you know, from Nigeria, almost to the Atlantic Ocean, and was probably one of the most elaborated political power in West Africa. One of the first prominent Songhai kings was Sunny Ali Bear. His reign was short, but significant. Unusually for a West African ruler during this period, he was a non-Muslim who continued to practice traditional religion. Leading a powerful army and navy, he earned the reputation as a ruthless commander, Yet he retained control over a vast and powerful empire and the loyalty of millions of subjects within the numerous kingdoms they dominated. I think people just recognize, you know, the domination of the Songhai Empire, and then they will pay their taxes to the empire. You stay loyal, 
because you can farm peacefully, you can trade peacefully. So they did recognize the Song Empire as a central power because they protect them. Although maintaining their own cultural identity and paying allegiance to this growing Songhai Empire, not everyone was happy. The capital city was located in Gao, about uh, 350 miles east of Timbuktu. Timbuktu was a learning center, and let me tell you that there was a kind of opposition between the population of Timbuktu and Sunni Alibair, because most of the population here were Muslims, and Sunni Alibair was an animist. But in the mentality of local people, he was a magician, he was a criminal. In 1468, he has occupied Timbuktu. All the scholars who were against his entrance in Timbuktu were either arrested, deported, or killed. Many scholars fled Timbuktu to avoid death. Sunni Ali Bear's reputation as a tyrannical leader who rejected Islam and persecuted Muslims marred the more positive aspects of his legacy. Sonny Alibert is having his own cultural identity. He has African values. But the first thing he did is the, the political organization. The land was well organized. He came up with a, a canal project that was linking Timbuktu, for example, to a part of Mauritania. He came also with another project uh, close to Timbuktu for the farmers. Though his canal project remained a pipe dream, his plans for building dikes to irrigate the land for farmers within parts of the empire were successful. They set Songhai on a path of economic expansion that was developed by his successors. It's not clear who directly succeeded Sonny Alibert, but by the late 15th century, the empire was being led by Askia Mohammed, a man who wrought changes, most notably in the development of universities and centers of learning, and establishing Islam as the religion of state to be practiced not just by the elite, but by the masses. He developed scholarship because Askia get along very well, you know, with this intellectual center which was Timbuktu. But you cannot think about all of these university has a similar campus. You know, like we see today, you have several learning centers in a town, and each ulema, each scholar, has a lot of kids coming to him and learning from him. Sankari Mosque in Timbuktu also served as a university. The students were grouped in four different sets at different levels, and each set would study for an hour at a time, while the other students took classes in the Quranic schools. We had 180 Quranic schools in Timbuktu by that time, and each Quranic school is counting an average of 75 or 80 students. Students came from everywhere. The University of Timbuktu was having relationship with Toledo in Grenada, in Andalusia, Spain, with Kerwan in Tunisia, the University of Al Azhar in Egypt, and other universities in Saudi Arabia, Zaria in Nigeria, and Kano. Book writing and book binding were lucrative businesses, and Askia Muhammad encouraged the production of printed material. The Sankori Mosque, where such books were read, still stands. And though it no longer houses books, it's still a center for worship. I'm going to give you a small idea about uh, Sankori Mosque. The architectural style is a Sudanese one. They use mud, okay? This is where we had 25,000 students in the past. The egg of the Atrish was eliminated the mosque and its guiding people from the desert, far from the city. Uh, they, they, they have a, a special lamp, they put it inside, okay? To show to people the city itself. This is Timbuktu and this is particularly the Sankara Mosque. The megaphone is uh, dating from 1998, this one. Being the fact that this, this mosque was dating from the 14th century, nowadays people use speakers to let more people hearing about the appeal for the prayer. Abdul Kaida Mama 
owned some of the books and manuscripts rescued from the old library and university in Timbuktu. His family has owned a private library of ancient manuscripts dating back to the 13th century, and hundreds of the delicate, leather-bound, illuminated tomes are now housed in rows and rows of dusty iron chests in a storeroom in his house. From a young age, I've been really interested in the old manuscripts. I am very proud that I'm protecting them and looking for a way to save all these manuscripts. Sometimes people look at me like I'm a foolish guy because I'm interested in these old manuscripts. They'd say to me, don't you have anything to do but this? But probably they don't know the importance of heritage. All the manuscripts are Arabic manuscripts, but we have some manuscripts translated into Songhoi, Tamashek, Fulani, Pearl. These are dealing with social sciences, Quranic studies, astronomy, algebra, and so on. And I've learned especially from those dealing with traditional medicine. Professor Ali Ul Sidi is in no doubt as to the greatness of the man who promoted such religious teaching and scholarship, Asghar Mohammed. He has proved that somewhere in Africa it's possible not only to come up with an empire, but also to have their own political system, their own society, but also to create and to rewrite also their own history. The Songhai Empire lasted till around 1590, when it finally succumbed to invasion at the hands of the Moroccan army, seeking to expand their own empire. But while it lasted, Songhai at its height had won respect for its social cohesion, political and economic stability, and scholarly achievement. As empires in the west of the continent were rising and falling, people in other parts of Africa were going through their own exciting and turbulent cycle.